Yeah. Remember that. It means to, if we want to find the most or the least or the fastest or the slowest or the greatest or the smallest, like we're finding an optimal value. The first thing we need to do is write an equation, the, the, output, the output of which is the thing that we want to find the maximum or minimum of. Does that make sense? Right? If I want to find the maximum area, I need to write an equation for the area, and I will use that to find the maximum area. If I want to find the smallest area, then I would want to write an equation for the area to find the smallest area, smallest cost, fastest time, smallest amount of time, and so on. So you've got to write the equation that I can optimize by taking the derivative. Okay. So, this guy says, at what argument x, the argument is just a fancy word for x, in the way, if you like, uh, is the maximum vertical distance between, that's the thing that we want to optimize, the vertical distance between the two curves uh, of f of x equals 2 cosine x, or x equals sine 2 x, and between the values of negative pi over 2 and pi over 4. How do I write a function, say, d of x? Okay, it's going to be the distance between the two. Distance formula. Distance formula is the distance between two points. Is it one function by Yeah, exactly. So the distance being vertical distance, right? Is it, doesn't it say that? Vertical distance. What's the distance between the two functions? Look, I got one function here and another function here. The vertical distance between the two, that distance would be this height minus this height, this say y value minus this y value. The slightly tricky thing about that is I want to make sure, well, I kind of want to make sure that whichever way I do it, whether, whether I subtract f from g or g from f, I'd like to get what? Yeah, I'd like to take the larger value minus the smaller value. Will that ultimately affect my finding the maximum value? Well, no. no, not really. As long as I'm thinking about those things, I could just go for it, right? Because then I'm gonna take the derivative, and then I'm gonna find the zero, right? Zero slope. And whether it's positive or negative, I'm still gonna find a zero slope. Um, so, case that little vague drawing is not good enough. Let's put it just out there. Everybody can see the same thing, the same visual. There we go. Okay, so uh, y1 will be f, that will be 2 cosine x. 2 cosine x. And then we'll have sine of 2x. And let's look at that graph. I might have to change this way down. This is the other one. Oh, and it's saying between negative pi over 2. Uh, what is negative pi over 2? How big is negative pi over 2? Like a decimal. One point five and some change. Okay, there's negative what? That's what that tick mark is. Well, it's somewhere three point one four. Yeah, uh, I would I would bet that where they cross. Yes, sir. Uh, can I have a copy of the algebra case? Square. Parallel or perpendicular lines or the other? Uh, the conic angle one. <laughs> well, there's, there's two. It's parallel or perpendicular lines. Parallel or perpendicular lines. Alright. Yeah, I would bet that this is where the intersecting is at negative pi over 2 and then pi over 4 would be half that distance but in the positive direction, so maybe like somewhere over there. Okay. Where is the distance its maximum? Its maximum value where? Is it here? No. Is it here? 
Now, is it here? Here? Or is it here? Well, it's hard to tell exactly. I know a lot of places that it isn't, but now I'm starting to put out some ideas of several places it could be, perhaps. Okay. So, you drew this one first. That was. Uh, that's not an arrow. An arrow. That was two cosine of x. Okay. So that's this guy right here. So that's the one that it, it, it just so happens we're lucky enough that it is always large or has a large y value. Right. So our d of x. We'll let it be what. Our, our distance function. Be what. Two cosine x, that is the larger here, right? That is the, the larger value. Then we'll subtract the smaller value, sine of 2x. Now, what does this function tell me? The vertical distance between the two. How big is the vertical distance here? And here? And here? Okay. The biggest, well, I think it's the biggest. Okay, let's just look at the graph of that function. No, that stuff is in the way. Uh, we've got what, two, two cosine x, two cosine x minus sine two x. Really good. Whatever you wanted. Okay. Look at that. Zero distance between the two. Kind of a, you know, if I were to actually, I could actually move this red thing up here. Look at that. Of course, it's exactly how big it is. It's the distance between the two functions. If I were to move this guy up there, and if I could see the function up that far, what do you think I'd see? I would see that that would be the height of that function. This would be the height of the function there. Uh, oh, the function is actually crossing right there, right? Because one of them is worth zero at that point. So the height between them is just the height of this function right here. And we come over here, the vertical distance is uh, getting smaller, right? It seems to fit a little bit better than there, yeah? Let's see what's going on there. Okay. So this third function is telling me my distance between the two. So if I were to say, uh, you know, I'll let the y values go to uh, five. So I can see this now. These lines don't make any sense. They're not even the scale anymore. So there's our uh, two cosine x, sine two x, and the y value of this function tells us the distance between the two functions. Slowly going down to no distance between the two functions. Okay. What do we see here? Most space in between, right? The maximum value of this function, this function being the one that gives us the height between, the distant vertical distance between the two functions. So that's the maximum value. This is the heart of optimization. I want to find that place. Where is this place? What is this distance between the two functions? That's what I want to know. How do I find it? The derivative set it equal to zero. Okay? So d prime is what? You walk me through it. Plus, minus, or plus? Minus. Minus. Two cosine. Two cosine. Two x. That's why is that there? Inside function. Two. Exactly. How do you do what with that? Set it equal to zero, negative two sine x minus two cosine two x equals zero. Places here, it seems like here it gets close to zero. Hmm. 
where we're solving for this x value here among any other x values that do the same thing to have a slope of zero. Hmm? Uh, well, this is where we have to go back to our trig uh, identities and uh, properties and crack open our books. And there's this one, I remember it's been so long ago, a year, two years. Benny, I know you asked, is it the double angle, the half angle formula? I know there's one out there that somehow takes this guy, and instead of it being in terms of 2x, it makes it in terms of x, 1x, half of 2x. Okay? So I, it's probably on that cheat sheet as well that I handed at the beginning of the year. We're looking. It's on the inside cover here. 2x. Now that is. So the cosine is right here. Double angle formulas. Cosine of 2u is equal to, I think we have our choice of actually three different things, but it <coughs> suits us best. Mm. Um, <coughs> of squares here. I will use the one that uses the sine squared only. So one minus two sine squared right there. One minus two sine squared. So that means that this is the same as one minus two times cosine, or one minus two times the sine squared of just x, not two x. Half of that, half of two x, which is x. So negative two sine x minus two times one minus two times the sine squared of just x. See, that's why it's called the double angle formula. It's a double an angle. It brings them down to just a single angle. Right, we'll just make sure we got that correct. That's good. Question. Um, before we did that, could we just uh, factored out the negative two and then divided that, or use the zero to divide that out and then just like make it without the negative two. So just get rid of that negative two factor? Yeah, is that actually Sure, like yeah, that, this will be positive. This will be plus that stuff. Makes it a little easier. So we've got sine of x plus one minus two sine squared x equals zero. So, I'm going to, if you were to this, I'm going to put negative 2 sine squared x, negative 2 sine squared x plus sine x plus 1 equals 0. And then I'm going to make it 2 sine x, which is 2 sine squared x, minus sine x, minus 1. Because I'm looking at, do you see what I'm, how I'm viewing this as a what? Quadratic. A quadratic that I want to factor. It's like, it's like 2x squared minus x minus 1. We, we factor it the exact same way. Let me uh, help you out if you don't see that. Let's get this out of the way. Look at this quadratic. Uh, 2x squared minus x minus 1. Right, we factor that, can we factor that with a, well, a 2x and an x? Plus 2 minus Got to multiply to make negative 1. Negative 1. Other 1? See? Oh, that would add up to 0. What would? 
Well, no, remember you got that 2x. Oh, that's all right. Okay. 2x times 1 is 2x, negative x, 2x minus x. So it has to be flip flop. Has to be flip it, flip flop it. Okay. Okay, well, it's not, th this isn't x, it's sine squared x, right? Remember that sine squared x is the same thing as sine x squared. So it's 2 times a thing squared minus that thing, the same thing to the first power, minus 1, the same as this quadratic. So we can factor this as 2 times the sine of x, uh, oops, I close that parentheses a little too soon, uh, plus 1 times sine of x minus 1 equals 0. There's two places. Not surprising, right? Remember that graph looked like it had a 0 sloped in two different places. So uh, now 2 sine x plus 1 equals 0 and sine x uh, minus 1 equals 0. Uh, I would add one to both sides. I'd find where the sine of x equals 1. What do you want to bet? That's that positive one over there. Why well, wouldn't it be like negative 1 half? Would you subtract 1 first? Oh, that's, I'm talking about this one here. Oh, okay. This, so two different equations. Right you're right. You're right. So this would be the sine of x is equal to negative 1 half. And so what x value gives us the sine, value, sine of 1 half? Negative 1 half. Remember so that when sine is second, isn't it? Root three over two. Yeah, it's the second one. Yes, the y value would be negative root three over two. Yeah. Well, negative. No, ne the ang you're looking at the cosine. I think it'd be root what the seven angle. Seven pi over six. Eleven mm -hmm. pi over six or seven pi over six. Mm -hmm. Two pi. Okay, so we have three. these. We have all these different possibilities, oh, right? We got this unit circle, and we see a negative one half sine here. We have a sine of negative one half over here, yeah. right? That's not a function. That's giving us multiple outputs. Remember how we talked about a while ago, maybe in algebra two, perhaps last year, yeah. where if I am looking for essentially the inverse sine of negative one half, and I'm getting all these multiple outputs, I remember, oh, it's because I want to go from negative pi over two to pi over two. So that's where I will find my angles. So not 7 pi over 6, and not 11 pi over 6, right? It's actually negative pi over, negative pi over 4. <coughs> six. Negative pi over 6. Oh. Negative pi over 6, or, oh, now, do you remember that graph? No, because that's outside of, the, like, basically we just want to look at this half of the circle. Oh, okay. <laughs> From negative pi over so negative 5 pi over 6 would be past the negative pi, negative pi over 2. We come over here to the calculator, turn that guy back on. What do you think? We just found negative pi over 6, right? Which one do you think that is? This one right here, it's negative. There's this other one. What, what, what x value do you think this is going to find if we solve this equation? It's going to be positive. Sine of x equals positive 1. Positive sine values happens for positive angles. We're going to find this guy over here, where it goes back to 0 as well. So there it is. There's the maximum uh, distance between them happens where? Pi over 6. Negative pi over 6. Negative pi over 6. And now the question is, uh, at what x? That's perfect. That's exactly what we want to know. Negative pi over 6. I don't think I can. I don't know, for some reason it won't let me check the answer. But there it is, negative pi over 6. And not a super easy one, but not that one. The hardest part was this, right here, I would say. Oh, the, my, tr my trig identities, I forgot that they're there. That they're there. <coughs> All right. Here, get rid of all that stuff. And start on the next one. What is the x-coordinate? That's very nice. When they want to just know what the x-coordinate is, that's about the most basic thing they can ask you. Of the point on the line that is closest to the origin. Okay. 
Well, it's just a line. It's got a slope of 2 and y-intercept of negative 3 uh -huh, of 2 over 1, like that. Right, it wants to know what point is closest to the line. Uh, so we're going to measure the distance from a point closest to the, closest to the origin. We need to find a way to measure um, the distance from a point to the origin. Say we're talking about this point. Uh, I think this one will work. Distance to the origin looks like that. Now, given that this is pretty much all I know about this function, this graph, like how can I use the stuff in there to define that distance to the origin? Distance thing is to the point zero zero, right? To the point zero zero. So you can. All right, we need two to do that. Do what? Do same and subtract the functions. Oh. But we don't have one function. Right, we only have one right. function. Uh, and that was a vertical distance. This is this this distance could be at any crazy angle. Okay. Well, I always like right triangles. Can I find with this this length and this length? Can I find this this distance here? Yeah. Now you're in theorem, right? What is this distance from here to there? X. X. It's a little bit tricky because it's kind of right there in your face. This distance is X. Choose an X. Like this easiest thing this is X. How high is this? Y. And Y is two X minus three, right? Everything's in terms of X. I like things to be in terms of X. To find this distance, I just need to use. Right? So call it d. d squared equals 2x minus 3 squared plus x squared. Right? So d equals the square root of a 4x squared minus 12x plus 9 plus x squared. Just multiply this out. d equals the square root of 5x squared minus 12 x plus 9. Okay. Great, now I have this function that tells me the distance from the origin to any point given any x. Okay. I plug in 2. I plug in 2, that's going to be 4, that's going to be 20 minus uh, 24, we're at negative 4 plus 9, that's positive 5, so the square root of 5, that's how far that point is from the origin, if x is 4. So what am I going to do with this function? Find the minimum. The minimum, yeah. The smallest distance. It's finding the derivative. So d equals what? One half, one half right? Because it's two to one half power. So keep that in the back of your mind. Two to one half power times function. the function five x squared minus twelve x plus nine to the very good. <coughs> Times, uh huh, and we're done. And we do what with this function? Set it equal to zero. Set it equal to zero. Twelve x plus nine to the negative one half times ten x minus twelve. Now what? So what? What is equal to zero? Solve now what? Solve it. What you doing? You said either side is zero. You said ten x minus twelve is zero. And then yes. So this times this is zero. Zero product property says two things that multiply together they equal zero. Then this factor has equal zero, or this factor has equal zero, right? Because they're multiplied together. So one or the other. Um, I'm going to say, is it, is it possible for, let me write what this actually is, 1 over 2 times the square root of 5x squared minus 12x plus 9. Can that equal 0? The numerator is 1, right? The, for a fraction to be equal to 0, the numerator needs to be 0. There's just no other way. Uh, otherwise, we're trying to make maybe this is zero in the denominator, but that's not good. You can't divide by zero. So that's out. I think that doesn't bring us any solutions. So 10x minus 
12 could be equal to 0, and x equals 6 fifths at 12 by 10, 6 fifths. 6 fifths is what I would type in there, if it were possible to do that. x is 6 fifths. I'm going to bet you that x is 6 fifths is right there, just a little bit past 1, and that the angle between this guy <coughs> and there is a is a So I'm still confused on how you got like the, the distance thing over on the right, like height. So I'm height of the Pythagorean theorem thing. Uh, okay, so take me back to here. Is that right? We get confused there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the distance is you get that it's that dotted line. Just to the line then, or to any point that I choose okay. on the line. So this point right here, the distance would then be. That guy right there. All right. All right. Now, for any point that I choose on the line, it's going to have two things that are very interesting to me. And x right here, right? x, that's this side of the right triangle. And this guy right here, which is the other side of the right triangle, and that is given by 2x minus 3, because that's the y value. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So give me an x value. I will take whatever that number is. I'll get that side of the triangle. I will then take that x and put it in 2x minus 3 and get this side of the triangle. And I'll use Pythagorean theorem to find the distance. Does that make more sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then we take the square root of both sides and solve it. Okay? Sound good? Write it in function. this guy. The, the thing here is we, we have to write a function that defines the thing we're trying to optimize. We're trying to optimize what in this problem? The perimeter of a rectangle. Okay. And we want to find the maximum perimeter of that rectangle. So we have to find a function that defines the perimeter of the rectangle. right? And that would be adding up this distance, and this distance, and this distance, and this distance. You just add them all up. Whatever, however that function looks, however messy it might look, we want to get it in terms of x, right? Which is convenient for functions because we have a horizontal of x and a vertical of y, and y is defined by x. Right there, right there. y is defined by x. Okay. So we need two of these, right? This guy and that guy. The tricky thing for, for some people to grasp is that like, we just get to choose x. We just get to pick where that value is, pick where, that, where I'm going to be, where I'm going to start drawing my rectangle. Right? I can go out to this x, and now I draw my rectangle up here until I hit the function. I draw it at a 90 degree, come down, OK. Right, got my rectangle. Choose any x I want. Okay. So this rectangle is controlled by x. x is in control of all of the aspects of this rectangle. So if I need to add this side and this side, like how, how long is this side? Two x. Two x. Choose an x that's a distance from the origin to the right. So this whole distance is 2x, and so is this. Okay. So 2 times 2x, that's half. Well, that's not really half the perimeter. I guess it's like kind of half the work. I'm going to add to that the rest of the, the, the vertical sides there. How long is this? It's y. And how, how do I, I don't want to just put y, right? Like 2y, because now I have this y variable that I have to deal with. All right, 4 minus x squared. That's what y is. Why is it, what's with this 2? Two of those sides to add up. Yeah. So two times four minus x squared. What will this tell me? Perimeter. The perimeter of this rectangle, any rectangle with any x. Now all I have to do is choose the x. Throw that x in there. This takes care of everything and calculates how long this side is and this side and how tall the rectangle is. Adds it all up and finds you the perimeter. 
or we want to find the maximum perimeter. Probably it would be pretty boring to find the minimum perimeter, that would be zero, probably, right? Or, or whatever this value is. So we want to do what for this function? Take the derivative. But before we do that, we might want to go like this. 4x plus 8 minus 2x squared, and then make it negative 2x squared plus 4x plus 8. That might be kind of helpful. P prime is negative 4x plus 4. And then do what with that? So it's going to be equal to 0. Equal to zero. It becomes almost rote at a point, if you're not careful. Uh, almost muscle memory, take the derivative, set it equal to zero. Okay. It'd be good if we kept in mind why we're setting it equal to zero. Why are we setting this equal to zero? The extrema, right? The maximum value of the perimeter function. It takes the perimeter function, it's going to top out somewhere, it's going to have the maximum value of the perimeter somewhere, at some x value. So I want to find where that slope is zero. Right? That's what happens when a function tops out. It has a slope of zero. So we set it equal to zero. Negative 4x plus 4 equals zero. And x equals 1. If x is 1, that gives us the maximum perimeter. Let's just make sure that's what they're asking for. What is the maximum perimeter? It doesn't say what x value. It says what is the maximum perimeter. Plug it all in. The perimeter function is right there. Or there. Okay? So plug the one. It could be easier. Negative 2 plus 4 plus 8. Close. Oh, I mean 10. 10. I got 10. There you go. 10 is the maximum perimeter. Writing that function, that's maybe the trickiest part. Write the function. Take the derivative, say like 0, solve for x. Sometimes solving for x is a little tricky, like with the trig functions. But not impossible, just a challenge. So our answer was 10. The actual perimeter is 10. Box. Open top box. So when you think, you gotta think, there is no lid to this thing. So any materials that we might use to build a lid are silly to consider because there is no top to this lid, so the top to this box. Open top, glass aquarium with a square base, that's good to know, right? Because if this, how long is this side, let's say? Let's say it's x. So how long is this side? Also x. That's very nice. Uh, 32 cubic feet of water, that's pretty helpful to know. 32 feet cubed, can't fit inside there. We don't know what x is, we don't know what the height is. But if, if, if I told you what x was, wouldn't you have to be able to figure out how high it would have to be to hold 32 cubic feet? Yeah, so this is like done, like its fate is sealed. Once I know what x is, this has to be a, a certain value, it's locked in. Uh, what is the minimum possible exterior sur the surface area of the aquarium? So, surface area. The surface area as a function of x. Give this function x, it will tell you the surface area. Let's start writing it. All right, I see a, a bottom. No top, we don't have to find that area, right? So what's the area of the bottom part? X squared. X squared. All right, that's part of it, right? But we need to add some more. We gotta get some more. What's that? Okay, call the, call the height y, uh, plus 4xy, right? Because this, this is x, this is y, absolutely. It's just that, that y there, we don't want that. Right? We're gonna get rid of that, does that make sense? We're gonna take the derivative now, because we're so used to taking the derivative, we're gonna have to take the derivative. Chain rule, treat y as a function of x, and we have a dy dx, do I know anything about dy dx? <coughs> Nothing, I don't know anything about it. This is not a related rates problem, right? So, but remember how we were saying earlier, we know that there's 32 cubic feet of water that can fit in here. So choose any x and y 
is absolutely calculatable. Right? Well, let's, let's use x and x and y to calculate 32. How would we use x and x and y to get 32? The volume, x squared y, x times x times y equals 32. Every day, all the time, x squared times y is always going to be 32. X can be it could. But we want to, like we don't know what the best x value is, right? We're trying to figure out what x is. If we tell x what to be, we kind of defeat ourselves. But what I can do y equals 32 over x squared, divide both sides by x squared. So now you can replace y with 32 over x squared. So this is now 32 over x squared. There is the surface area function. Clean up a little bit, surface area. x squared plus, this guy cancels out that guy there, so we get uh, 32 times 4, which is 128 over x. Is that all good? So we're all just like on the same wavelength here, both in my mill. S of x. Well, I guess I don't want to write S of x again, right? I want to find what? S prime of x, which is 2x plus, you could do that. But what I could do that makes it easier is write it as 128x to the negative one. So now it's actually just minus, yeah. 128 over x squared, x to the negative two. Okay, uh, now we do what with this function? Zero, right, we're finding the maximum, right? Minimum. What is it? Minimum. Trying to find the smallest amount. Why would, why would we care about finding the smallest amount of glass we could use? Save money. Save money. We are aquarium makers, and we want to use the least amount of glass. That's the most expensive part of this whole thing. Probably these little things are not that expensive, but the glass is expensive. We want to minimize that. So we set it equal to zero. X plus, I don't want to put plus in that. Minus 128 over x squared. Okay, I'm just going to multiply both sides by x squared. It's left the x squared denominator. Of course, this times x squared is 0 still. 2x times x squared is 2x to the third. Minus 128. Add 128 divided by 2. x cubed equals 4. Does 64 have a cube root? Oh, that's, that's confirmation of a job well done, right? It feels good to get a whole number answer. Okay. So four is what though? Four is y. Four is y? Four is four is x. Is that what they want? No, they want the surface area. What is the minimum possible exterior surface area of the aquarium? So we just take this, plug it in there, into the surface area function, which it may be a little easier than there. So what? 16 plus 32. So 16 plus 32, what? 48. 48 square feet. That function? And make sure that x is what they want, or if it isn't, find what they want. Okay. Sound good? Mm -hmm. Got one more. Yes. One more. tells you that it is uh, an ellipse. Maybe ellipses are far from your mind. That's okay. Uh, 
you probably don't remember that this is an ellipse with its center at zero, uh, a vertical major axis of three, which is the square root of nine. One, two, three. One, two, three. Is it always at three or is that kind of function? It's because the, the square root of nine is three. So it's like the structure of the equation of a uh, and then, so how do you, how far out do you think this goes in the x direction? Zero. So you're catching on our end. Two. Okay, you know what an ellipse looks like? It looks something like this. That looks good. Okay. An ellipse, they want to know, what's the largest rectangle uh, with a size parallel to x and y, so we're generous with them, uh, that can be inscribed in this ellipse? So maybe, it's not gonna be very easy. So I'll draw a, a rectangle in here. So let's get here. That, and that, any of the best. This is the area of the largest rectangle. So we need to write a function, right? To find the largest area, so what kind of function should it be? A function that finds the area. Yeah. Area as a function of, well, probably x. Okay. Well, how about I find the area of this guy here? Of a rectangle in general. Length times width. So this times that. This times that. How long is this? X is from here to there. X is also from there to there. Like it's the a length of X. It's actually negative. Still, the distance from here to there is worth two of whatever X you choose. 2x times how tall is it? 2y. This is nice symmetrical shape, but you'll want y. You don't want y. So you're going to take this equation and solve it for y. So we can replace y with something that's in terms of x. Okay? So we'll solve it for y. We'll multiply both sides by 36. That's what we have to do, 36. So we get 9x squared plus 4y squared equals 36. You see what happened there? Yeah. Multiply both sides by the least common denominator. So just solve it for y here. It's getting y by itself. Good looking or not. So we do what? Subtract 9x squared, 4, 4, y squared equals 36 minus 9x squared, four, so y squared equals 9 minus 9 fourths x squared, square root of 9 minus 9 fourths x squared. Just a big red alert, flashing light warning that this is not three minus three halves x. That's not how square roots work. Right? You know, just take the square of everything in sight because you see a square root somewhere. Square root means I can multiply this thing by itself. I cannot multiply three minus three halves x by itself and get nine minus nine fourths x squared. I'll get close. I'll get a nine and I'll get a 9 fourths x squared will actually be positive, and I'll also get an x term in there. It'll be a big mess. That is not the square root of that thing. It's just the square root, that's just what it is. It just is the square root. It's gross, but it's what it is. So y is that thing we just found. So it takes the place of y, the square root of 9 minus 9 fourths x squared, gross. Maybe we'll multiply this together. We get 4x times the square root of 9 minus 9 fourths x squared. We could take the derivative by doing uh, the product rule. Uh, yeah. You could do the product rule of this. You could do, 
times it's the same thing. Let me see. Uh, 16x squared times 9 minus 9 fourths x squared. You see what I did there? Yeah. I took the. I wrote this as the square root of 16x squared, right? And then multiply the two square roots together, and now this could be the square root of. Now I have to distribute this. Uh, 9 times 16. Real quick. 144. 1, 144 x squared minus, this works out nicely because 16 divisible by 4, we get 4, so 36 x to the 4. That might be a little nicer to take the derivative of because I only have to worry about this chain. Right? I don't have to the derivative. But however you do it, it's fine. Okay, so A prime is what? One half. One forty-four x squared minus thirty-six x to the fourth to the negative one half. We get messy here. Times two eighty-eight x minus. 44 again, 144 mm -hmm. x to the third, it's done. So what do we do with this function? Zero, and then we solve for x, and we get a very similar situation to, I think maybe this first one. Um, We have the product of two things is equal to zero, so each thing gets set equal to zero. This guy here, I'm seeing, not possible for this to be equal to zero, right? Because it's got a square root of the denominator. The numerator is just a one, and the denominator is two times the square root of one forty-four x squared minus thirty-six x to the fourth. So, notice that or not, I mean, you're going to come down to the same conclusion. We have to solve this. So, what can I factor out of 281? 144. Oh, okay. Faster than me. 2, and I can factor out an x. So 2 minus x squared times 144 x. So x equals, from this equation, or setting each of them equal to 0, right? Square root of 2, or x equals 0. What do you think? x equals 0 makes much sense? This is not going to have a very big area. No? Uh, so that area would be uh, like a minimum of the area, at 0 area. Uh, but square root of 2, well, plus or minus the square root of 2, which is kind of silly because plus square root of 2 is right there, minus square root of 2 is right there, the same thing. Um, I wonder why we didn't find an x is 2. square root of 2 in here, and or, or here. That might be nicer. That would actually be nicer because you square and, and take to the fourth power of square root of 2, which is a little easier to swallow. So we get the square root of 144 times 2. I'm going right here. Square root of 2 squared is 2 minus 36 times 2 squared which is 4. 288 minus 144. 288 minus 144. 
makes me feel like I did it. That is what it is. I mean, we, we have these funky looking equations to write sometimes, and we have to take the derivatives of them, and they're nasty. It is what it is. We're certainly equipped. We have everything that we need, uh, with the exception of maybe being reminded, like, oh, yeah, I need to go and uh, see that the cosine of 2x is equal to 1 minus 2 sine squared of x, things like that. Uh, maybe solving trigonometric functions if we need a refresher or something. Um, how about I let you have one optimization problem for about five minutes, okay? And yeah, and then we're gonna go on to the next thing. Find the equation of a tangent line for any function that we're given. Not just this one, but any one in general. Okay? So let's treat this like a general function, f of x. Okay? Um, and let's start there. Let's give that a little bit of practice. But first, let's, let's figure out how it goes. Let's start with the equation of a line blueprint. The point slope form. Can anybody tell me the point slope forms off the top of your head? Slope intercept or point slope? Starts with y minus x. Y1 equals m times x minus x1. There we go. If you'll notice, m, which is the slope, equals y, let's say 2 minus y1, x2 minus <laughs> x1. If I multiply both sides by x2 minus x1, what do I get? I get m times x2 minus x1 equals y2 minus y1. Calling this y instead of y2 is not that big a deal. It's just saying we kind of want this to stay a variable. We want this x to stay a variable. But we know this is true. We could, we could see this. We could draw a picture of this for a fifth grader. I would hope say like, this is why this calculates the slope between two points. And this should be a way of finding the equation of a line if I know a point on the line and the slope. Right? OK. So let's calculusize it. Calculusize. Uh, I guess we get another color. OK, so what we need to do is find the equation of a tangent line at a specific point, a specific value of x. We'll call that specific value of x c. Okay? So c is like this particular value of x somewhere on the x-axis. Okay. Um, so if this function is f of x, Y minus. How will I find this y value? Okay, we're getting there. Okay. What do you think? Here's x minus. What do you think? C. Okay. And this m is the slope. Now this is where we calculusize it. The slope at this value. How do I find the slope of a tangent? Derivative. Derivative. And then what? You plug, you know, in the value. plug in the value, right? I want to know the slope. I don't want to tell the slope to be zero. So I take the slope is the derivative of that. And I plug c in there. Okay. That's it. Let's do this for. Uh, here we'll grab. First, we will lock this. Lock, lock, lock. And we'll grab this and then copy it over. So we're 
we're using this blueprint, write the equation of a tangent line. Now we're going to want to do stuff with that, but first let's write the equation of a tangent line. Start with that. We'll start with one that we work out together. How about if the function itself is the sine of 3x? Can anyone tell me what I'm missing right now? Slope. Yeah, the slope. What's preventing me from finding the slope here? C. What is C? Right, I have to tell you what that is. It's important for you to recognize that you need that. So let's say at x equals 0. All right, so I've given you a function. I have given you an x value. I want to know what's the equation of the line that's tangent that goes through this point. Right? It goes through the point uh, that's on this graph at x equals 0. Is that making sense? So let's get to work. If I were to just follow this just straight on through, the equation would be y minus okay, f of c. What's f of c? The sine of 3 times 0, okay, and that's the sine of 0, which is 0. Yeah. So y minus 0, that made our work a little easier. Now I need f prime of c. Cosine f prime. f of x equals cosine of 3x. So times 3. Times 3, so let's throw a 3 out there. Sorry, that's f prime. Uh, f prime of c, that means put 0 in here, okay. Zero. What's the cosine? What's three times zero? Yeah. Zero. What's cosine of zero? One. One. And what's three times one? Three. Three. So our slope of our tangent line is three for this function. Times x minus, which is zero. Y equals three x. That's the equation of the tangent line, specifically at x equals zero. Okay. That's the first thing we need to do. So it's pretty simple. Right? We use the slope intercept form. If I didn't have like a, a two or something that go up there, just add two to both sides. Right? And then I'd have the equation of my line. My line intercept my line intercept. Well, I want you to do that same thing. For this function, right here, this function is 2x squared minus 2x plus 3. Right? This function is x squared minus 2x plus 3. I'll rewrite this up here if you like y minus f of c equals f prime of c, that's not c, c times x minus c is. That uh, one. Who at what? Oh, because yeah. given the specific x value, that's c, and if I want to know what the y value of c, or at c is, I plug it into the function of c. Okay. Um, the slope of this line is what? Prime of c. There's no, there's no other point for us to find on this line time being, right? To do y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 over the slope. The slope is simply the slope of the tangent line. That's what we've been learning. Like, that's almost everything we've been learning up to this point is about derivatives and how derivatives tell us the slope of the tangent line. And we want the equation of the tangent line, so the slope of our line is the slope of the tangent line. So, uh, we have y minus, what is f of c, f of 1? Three. three. So y minus three 
equals, okay, if I want to find f prime, I need to find f prime. f prime of x is 4x minus 2. f prime of what? 1 is what I want to find. So that's 4 minus 2, that's 2. So the slope of our tangent line is 2 over 1 times x minus 1. Okay. So y, you could say, equals 2x minus 2 plus 3. Does that make any sense? Okay. And so y equals 2x plus 1. I look at the line, I get confirmation of that. Y intercept of 1, slope of up 2 over 1. Yep, that's exactly what I thought. tangent line at x equals 1. We could have chosen x equals 2, x equals 3, x equals negative 5, whatever we want. And then we can find the equation of that tangent line. Um, okay, so there's one thing we want to be able to do, and by the way, Khan Academy will ask you to do this, and they'll give you to, you know, the equation may be in some different looking form. Uh, they call it big L of X. Makes sense, right? Why big L? I use the letter L. No, it's not used for anything else. What would we just find? Find the equation of the and line, right? Yeah. Alpha line. That's what they're saying. And on the problems, like they're go they're going to say something like L of X equals, I believe they write it like this, F prime of actually they use A instead of C. But our book uses C. It doesn't matter. Uh, times X minus A plus what? Regular f of a. a. They can state that in some of the problems. Given that l of x equals this, which we understand now, right, how we came up with it with the uh, point slope form. Find l of x. Find the, the equation of the tangent line. Okay. find something called the linear approximation of the function. Linear approximation of the function. Let me show you what the linear approximation is after I tell you what that was. Let's bring back the cool graph in this hand. Alright. So here is like I, I need to choose an x, okay? And then we kind of hang out with that tangent line, that specific tangent line and try to do stuff with it. Um, so. Here is the function f of x. Okay. Here is the tangent line at one. This particular function. Now, if I were to say this y value is approximately the same as this y value, what would you say? It's not. It's close. I mean, on a scale of the universe, sure, it's close. But then so is every other point on Earth. Kind of not close. But as we move closer to what? To 1, to C. Okay? To whatever C is. What happens? It's closer. It's better and better and better. Is that pretty good? Well, what if I zoom in now? Right? You know, I change the scale. How is that approximation? That's not good. Not as good. 
It's better than it was, not as good as it could be, right? So what are we learning about the approximation, the linear approximation of the function? It's better the closer we get to C, whatever C is, okay? So now we have to figure out, if I do want to use that value on the line, that y value on the line, to approximate the y value of the function, First of all, does that make sense what I'm saying right there? I'm going to use the, the y value of the line, the red thing, to approximate the y value of the function, the blue thing. To find it approximately. First of all, why would I even want to do that? Why would I want to use a line instead of the function? Maybe I only know something about the tangent line, and well, I'm close enough to see might as well use the line instead of the function itself. Uh, how about, what if the function is crazy? Is it like a crazy, complicated, trigonometric function? It's just all sorts of nuts, right? So what would be easier would just be use a line. Because a line is a very simple function to plug something into. I'll use that instead. Uh, and then it'll make my life a little easier, OK? If you don't buy that, I don't know. It is, it is just purely math sometimes, okay? We, it gets used in real life, and we'll try and look at some of those things, but first we have to figure out, like, how do we easily find that y value, okay? Um, so, to do that, we can write it down. Okay. So, First, recognize this x value as what? C. C. Not just one in this specific case, but C in general. Okay. So this x value is C. Okay. Uh, this guy right here, this y value is f of C, right? This guy is like L of C, right? I'm going to plug it into the, the line equation. Well, L of C and F of C, what can we say about L of C and F of C? They are they're directly related. Pretty close. Yeah. Like L of C is approximately the same as F of C if, if we're not too far away from C. Stay close to home. Home being whatever this is, whatever C is. So let's let's then say that like this guy right here, this value right there, that's x. That's the x that we choose. Go over to x and then say, what is the value of the function at x? Right, and then use the, the line to approximate. So far, so good. X. Um, actually, what have I just done? I've written it incorrectly. What's f of c? f of c is down here at c. Very silly. f of c and l of c. What can we say about f of c and l of c? They're actually exactly the same. So this is actually f of. And this is L of x. L being the equation of the standard line. Let's look, Let's look at that. Y minus f of c equals f prime of c times x minus, let's call it c. In Khan Academy, they use a. So what we want to do is find the y value of the line, right? We don't exactly want to find the equation and plug a number into it. Because first of all, we just recognize, like let's just add f of c to both sides. 
to start with that. Well, f of c is just like the starting point. And then that point on the line is just a certain distance past that. Right? Does that make sense? So we get f of c plus some more. What makes up that some more? f prime of c times x minus c. Right? Makes up that some more. So let's rewrite something here. f prime of c. Now, what could we call x minus c? What if I took this distance x and subtracted c, what would I have? Like, could somebody come up and show me with their hands like which, wh what distance I've just found by taking x minus c? Between what? Between x and c. Yeah. I'm just finding this. That is x minus c. Right? Take like a, a little bit of a, a twisting of the concept of what we were just thinking. But x minus c is this distance, and a lot of times we call this distance from this x value to this x value delta x. Ah. So rather than call it x minus c, we could call it delta x. Okay. I kind of don't need to worry. All I need to know is like how far is it from the c value over to the x value? Is it a little bit? Is it 0 0.01? That's all I need to know. I just need to know that's 0 0.01. Kind of nice. I need to know the starting point. I need to know the slope. And I need to know how far I'm going over it. Okay. So that's what you call delta x. We also call it dx. That's what we call the differential. Now, delta x and dx are the exact same thing. Whether you're talking about the line or you're talking about the function, the change in x is the same for both. Because I'm going from here over to there. Now, y is a different story. Right? So, like, the true change in y from there to there, right? There. So there's the, the first y. This guy's called delta y. The approximation of that delta y we call dy. Here to there we call. So delta x and dx are the same thing, but delta y and dy are two different numbers. To find delta y, you'd actually have to find the y value of the function, subtract this y value of the function, and you'll find that vertical change. For dy, dy is actually just this. I'm not expecting that that was immediately obvious <laughs> to you, but f prime of c times delta x or dx, whatever you want to call it, delta x or dx is the same thing, the slope of that. is the slope times that distance so we get the vertical, right? Yeah. We could set that up a little more concretely with similar triangles and all this kind of stuff, but we don't really like, as we said, that f of c is like our starting point, plus that little bit more, right? Does that make sense? That little bit more. This little bit more. We start here at this y value. We add dy, not delta y, because that's the, that's the actual function. We add dy, that's the vertical chain on the, the tangent line. And now we have the y value at this x over here. So, if I want to find dy, that's f prime of c times delta x. If I want to find the actual y value, that would just be that f prime of c times delta x time, or plus the y value, right? The change in y plus the original y value. All right. So, but now, if I'm asked to approximate, say, the y value of this function with the tangent line, 
let's let's do that. Okay. This is going to be the approximation of the y value. Okay. F of c. What's f of c? Well, I can plug in one into all this and find out that I have three. Okay. That's the f of c part plus. This is going to turn out to be dy plus this change of y on the vertical, or not on the vertical, but on the uh, tangent line. Okay. F prime of c, didn't we already find that earlier? <laughs> Previous problem? This one way back, well, it was two. <coughs> two. Now all we need to know, here's the kind of cool thing, we just need to know what's the change in x. From here to there, What's the change in x? Well, I just need to kind of know what is that x value. Well, it's 1.038. So what goes there? Change. So just 0.03. Right. This is 1, and this is 1.038, so this is 0 0.038. So 3 plus 2 times. 0 0.038, that like little <coughs> of the slope, and we get what? <laughs> Three point something. Three point zero. Three point zero six. I think seven cents. Yeah. That was a. A whole lot easier than taking 1.038 and plugging it in for x and squared. Yeah. Plugging it in for x and multiplying by 2 and subtracting that and adding 3 was a lot easier than that. And plugging in 1.038 into the function. And that's why we use it sometimes. Maybe the calculation for these little minuscule changes is a little complicated and it would be a whole lot easier just to take, all right, so like maybe this is a little margin of error right here. And my, my box that I'm measuring at, it, it, it's, it's probably about uh, 3, but it, it, it might vary about 0 0.038 inches. Right? How, much, how much issue could that really cause? How much volume uh, could we really lose or gain on that box if it varies by 0 0.038? This is the kind of thing to calculate. Right? Um, we want to find the equations of tangent lines. We want to find the approximate y value. I have this new x that is maybe as much as 0 0.038 or 0 0.01 or 0.1 away from this c value. So uh, it's going to be our local linearization here. The kinds of things you can see. The first question that's set up is: Here's your function. Given that. The, the equation of the tangent line, that's essentially what this is saying. The equation of the tangent line is that. Okay. Write a rule for L of x, just find the equation for the tangent line. 16. Hey, we're gonna do this. And then I use it to approximate the square root of 17. Where delta x would be 1. Uh, 1 away from okay. Have a good day. In the classroom, you don't have to. You can just make, make sure you've logged out. You can leave those on your desks. Oh, sorry.